Hello, everybody, and welcome to another edition of History After Hours. My name is Kevin Pumphrey, and with me is Mr. Ron Franklin. We are history teachers at Lakeside High School in Hot Springs, Arkansas. We are recording this on Friday, August the 30th, 2024. And uh, this is the start of our 10th year of doing this podcast, so that's exciting. And uh, we appreciate all the listeners who have tuned in to hear us ramble over the years. And in this episode, we recap uh, the summer break, the major events that occurred, including the assassination attempt on former President Trump, uh, Biden dropping out of the race, and many other historic topics that have occurred all within the last few months. So with that, I hope you enjoy the podcast. All right, this is History After Hours, and it's just me and Mr. Franklin today, Um, and this is our first episode for Season 10. This is our 10th year of podcasting. How crazy is that? That right there is crazy. So if you don't remember, and you can go back into the archives, I guess, and get this information. The archives, yeah. But um, when I got a job here, I listened to podcasts, and me and Mr. Franklin... Just started talking out in the hallway, and I thought, hmm, I wonder if the students would want to hear us yap about whatever, and we started doing that 10 years ago now. 10 years ago, I didn't even know what a podcast was. He's yeah. Like, hey, man, you want to do a podcast? <laughs> I, I guess. What is what is it? <laughs> yeah, whatever that is. <laughs> Sounds yeah. fun. I don't know. Yeah. Yeah, that's but in it the has, early hey, days. But for us to keep this going for 10 years, though, for real, like that's it. I think it's turned into something really more than maybe what we thought it would originally. We'll, we'll throw this mm-hmm. out together and maybe some kids will listen to it and maybe some other people might. But to have it go not just within the school, but within the state, within the region, across the nation, people listen. And then pretty early on, we had we got some markers that showed that we've got international audiences too. So that's freaking neat. Yeah, for That's us. crazy to think about. Like I never, when we're recording these things, I never actually, it doesn't cross my mind who will be listening really. It's just mainly talking with you and whatever happens, happens. And people, if they find it useful or valuable or if the students will listen, because we go to Collective Coffee and, right. uh, you know, we do live events, we do interviews. But you know, I think you and I talked about this once before, though. Our voices are not going to be in perpetuity. Like yeah. somebody will be able to find this, this this decade worth of us reacting to whatever's going on in our lives or or um, or, or speculating on what might be happening. My grandchildren, my great-grandchildren, people down the family line would be able to if they were interested in hearing what we were, what was life like then. Like, we've got this capsule. Like, right? it's really, I wish I had that for my parents when they were younger, for my grandparents, my great-grandparents, whom, and this is the part that I think I've mentioned to you before, I can't remember what they sounded like. I, I can remember them. I was fairly mm-hmm. young when, the, when both passed. I can't really audibly... You know what I mean? Imagine, oh, yeah. if you will, what they sounded like. I, get, I can get kind of close, but I can't do it. I wish I had a recording of them. We don't have any recordings of them. It was before we had camcorders and right. and phones. It was and hard like to record anything in until the 20th century. I mean, We've got some grainy people. old uh, Super 8 video, but that's it. And there's no audio with it, unfortunately. Mm. You can go on YouTube and listen to some of the earliest recordings of people. And I'm talking 1850s. I've, eight, heard, I've, heard, on von, I've heard Otto von Bismarck's voice. Yeah. That's you it's know, crazy that the there's some of Germany. that. But I mean, that's that's the rich people. That's the people that had technology. Most Is there anything people, with Lincoln's voice? I don't think Do so. You know, I don't think there's any recorded Lincoln. Hmm. Um, the, the ones I'm talking about are literally the guys that invented the first recording on ten. Edison. You could only play it once. As even before Edison, oh. there was some some technologies that could record this creepy. Like you hear a woman singing in the background, <laughs> and you hear. It's it's like it's it's all in Europe somewhere, I, and it's uh it's creepy. You can you can access that. It's uh, so they're just testing the what what they can do. Right. Testing the they, science, right? And and what's crazy is the first recordings that you had. If you played it, it ruined it. So like these were the unplayed recordings that oh, they wow. found. Like and it was on ten, hmm. picking up vocal waves or whatever. But in as history teachers too, it would be awesome to be able to hear and experience as much history as we can, even if it's our relatives. Mm-hmm. But yeah, our grandkids, we could create AI versions of it's us. An, it's like an, it's sort of like an audio journal, right? Yeah, it really is. All right. Well, we're doing this podcast before we do our live one next week, mm-hmm. because there's been a couple things that have happened since we last recorded. Yeah. There's been a moment, <laughs> a moment or two worth of historical notation, right? Yeah, we're not going to be able to get to everything that has happened, but we're going to discuss some of the big, you know, as history teachers, we focus on politics, we focus on history, historical events. 
So let's just go through a few that have happened over the summer over our break. The first one that comes to mind is the is the assassination attempt mm-hmm. on Trump. Right. Now, first of all, just try to get back to that day. What was your initial reactions as a history teacher when, when you saw the reports coming in? Well, okay, I'll, I'll back up beyond that because as a, much of a firebrand as he is, he stokes violence. And I'm sort of surprised that there hasn't been some sort of physical altercation with him or maybe it's because he's been really real well surrounded by his uh, security people. Maybe they've done a good job of, of insulating him from that. But I know that there are a lot of people who are passionately for him and a lot of people who are passionately against him. So I'm, I'm, I'm a little surprised that, that no one has, and again, I'm not talking about like shooting him, but I'm, I'm surprised there hasn't been some sort of like actual physical pushback. With that being said, when I first heard it, I don't, I don't remember how I heard it. First. Somebody texted me, I think, and said, hey, turn on the news. I think it was my daughter, actually. Hey, turn on the news. And I've turned that on there and they're replaying the, the moment where he's, he turns his head and then all of a sudden you can you know, see him kind of duck and then he grabs his ear and the people in the stands. And I was like, oh my, oh my God, like how? Okay, then I was, you know, is he okay? Obviously he was by that point. By the time I turned it on, they knew he was okay and he was already in the car and gone. I didn't see it happen live. Did you? No, I was getting ready to play. I think it was on a Saturday, right? I think it was, it was Friday or Saturday. I think I was getting ready to play music, and I was getting it on my phone kind of as we were getting ready to play, so I couldn't really focus on it. Mm-hmm. But I was stunned, yeah. of course. And I'm like you. It's seen, I'm, I'm, who knows how many uh, attempts have been thwarted right. that we don't really know about. Um, but they whisked him away. Right. And then, but the, but the reports were... Yeah, I mean, and you saw the pictures of him with blood, you know, streaming down his face, and then he stands up with the scowl on his face and the fist in the ear, and everybody's unbelievable, unbelievable moment for him, especially and for and for people who support him too, because that's an iconic picture. And I said that that'll be in the history book. I told my wife that that picture's going to be in the books. Just to keep your head together, and look, we we make we talk about Trump a lot about his lack of sophistication, et cetera. He doesn't really know much about history or politics, and but he's a genius in marketing Mm -hmm. and seizing the moment. And he, to keep his head together, <laughs> literally keep his head together. Oh, ooh. and and you know he went down, yeah. and then to come up with with the fight, fight, fight with the flag, and whoever took that shot should get a Pulitzer for being there to yeah. take that iconic shot. It, it's unbelievable. And yeah, he didn't yeah. cower down. I mean, he he insisted that they let him stand back up. Which then you don't know if there's another shooter or not. You don't know if there's more danger. He's to stand back up like that, push your way through the Secret Service agents who are trying to surround you to get you to a car. And so on one hand, it's a little foolhardy. Oh, on the yeah. other hand, since it since there wasn't any other shooter and there wasn't any other danger, actually, at that point, it but but that moment becomes, you know, certain pictures take on a life of their own, if you will. And that one, I think, is going to be. you'll That one will, will, will stay. It will resonate. But my reaction... Just going back to that is, yeah. I, I was I can't somebody actually did that secret service and then I'm failure. Like, how did they actually do that? What? Yeah, the secret service. Where were those guys? And then you learn that dude was on a rooftop, not really that far no, away. And all of the video coming out about the, uh, you know, the the crowd who was saying there he is, there he is, and it's what I'm. So I, maybe that's the whole thing's stunning. But then the more you unravel, the more you see this series of unfortunate events that led to that. You know, that he should have never even gotten that far. Oh, yeah. They, they knew about him apparently 90 minutes before it happened. 90? 90. A Secret Service counter sniper was going off duty and saw him kind of snooping around back there and texted his fellow Secret Service agents about the guy. Um, so they, that was the first text message that they received apparently. But, yeah, to, to know that he's in the area and then for people to shout out, hey, he's up there with a gun, and mm-hmm. they still couldn't stop him. It's it's worse, I think, than the Ronald Reagan failure. I mean, this this to me is, seems so well, inadequate yeah. Yeah. because it's such a you – know, Reagan was leaving a building, getting into a car. It's kind of yeah. chaos anyway. Yeah, dude just jumps out of the crowd, basically, and – Start shooting at him. Trump is in a fixed position, vulnerable mm-hmm. to an elevated position. Mm-hmm. That seems like a Secret Service failure because that's Secret Service 101. You've got to, you know, secure the area if you know that you know, it's a controlled environment. They should have had that whole place locked down, which they usually do. What, what, and I'm not one that believes in luck or fate necessarily, but how fortunate turning his head that he turned moment. his head when yeah. he did and that bullet just went by him. It's so much so that. You can't even tell that he's got a scar. I mean, he was hit by something. He got hit by something. The FBI says it was a bullet fragment or something. Clipped his ear. Oh, yeah. He, I mean, he was, he was you know, legitimately hit by something. Oh, yeah. But Somebody now, died in the crowd, too. But now to be, to not even have a concussion 
if mm-hmm. that thing had gotten even just a little bit closer, any even know. part of it had gotten closer to him, it would be a completely different story, and that would then be... To compare his reaction, standing up, fight, 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 after that, and then to compare that to Joe Biden, who was the presidential candidate at the time, I thought, that's it. Trump's mm-hmm. elected. There, I mean, it was good. he was already ahead. This mm-hmm. just made him seem strong, and Biden had already seemed weak and disillusioned, you know, like at the debate performance and all that. And what's so crazy is how quickly we forget about this assassination attempt and how quickly it, he lost steam from it. It fell off the news cycle pretty quickly. Why is that? That's weird. Yeah. Why is that? But even his people stopped talking about it. Yeah. Maybe because he wasn't. And I don't want this to sound, I'm not trying to be provocative Provocative when I say this. Thank you. Yeah. But he, it didn't really, he's not really injured. He didn't have to get his ears sewn back on. He had, mm, yeah. he had that thing on his head, but he was actually playing golf the next day. And now there's nothing, there's no telltale, just be honest, I haven't been that close to him to see if he's got a scar on his ear or not, but he doesn't, but he doesn't even mention it, which is weird for him. You would think that he'd be on and on and on about this and he's not, yeah. he's gone on to other things and that's weird. It is, it is Trump though, right? I mean, to me, it's, it's very similar to, to the, you know, he says something. Yeah, but something, he can milk this. He could, he could, but he doesn't milk. I mean, the things he milks, he's already back to again. Right. Like he's been making fun of Joe Biden still. And Joe Biden's not even running for president anymore. Mm-hmm. And he keeps bringing up Joe Biden and, and, and coming up with nicknames. What do you like, crowd better? Don't bri- he can't mm-hmm. get away from his old routine. Mispronouncing Kamala's name. Yeah, I think purpose. we forget Trump's old. Mm-hmm. You know, we, we think he's some spring chicken compared to Biden, which he kind of looks that way. But then you realize he didn't really know how to milk this. Because all he can think about is what he's said. But we for just the past got through saying years. that he's a brilliant self promoter, and you would think that this m- potential martyrdom that he almost mm-hmm. experienced would be something that he and his people would be just, yeah, just like keep. Maybe because it turned out that dude was not some crazed leftist. Maybe oh, that's maybe. why they were like, okay, we can't go down this path because maybe. I mean, I, I wonder. Maybe he. It's hard for him to be a sympathetic figure. That's not even his, to himself. Even to himself, like he is the <laughs> dominator. I go, I go out and I crush, and I, he doesn't. He doesn't want to come off as I'm so, a victim because that was a. He's all about victimhood, though. What do you mean? He whines constantly. But I don't think he likes the fact that he was on that side of it. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just guessing here. Yeah. It kind of comes and goes. Uh, the crazy stuff he says on Twitter or wherever, that also just comes and goes. It's right. just like one thing after another with him. Yeah, maybe you're right. Maybe he just goes back to what he knows, and that's a— But I don't know. It was just strange how quickly it seems to have fallen off yeah. everybody's radar. I, I think I saw something on the news last night about the gun, but they, oh, but yeah. that was all. They didn't really harp on, you know, you haven't really heard much about the dude himself. You get little snippets of information. They haven't done a great exposés on his background, and maybe they don't want to explore that again because he's not some radical leftist who was, uh, you know, hired by Castro. To- <laughs> yeah, you can't. I mean, I think there was an attempt to try to somehow find a way to blame Biden and the Democrats for it. Yeah. But it but just wasn't there. It was, yeah. And apparently, dude had, this, this came out a few days ago, apparently he had some sort of, when he was doing his searches about what he was going to do, I guess, that he was also searching DNC, he was also searching Biden and where they're going to be. Yeah. He was, but apparently he was because Trump was going to land there in Pennsylvania, which is where the guy was from, that right. became the target. So I don't know that he had, yeah. I don't, maybe he was just looking for notoriety. Well, Yeah, you see. It's, it's a weird kind of environment that we're living in because you can get famous and people do that. But I don't think he's going to be, you know, I don't know the guy's name. I don't either. I mean, I'm trying. I'm hoping they will keep it out of the news as much as possible. So maybe that's another good reason is we're not focusing. Yeah. We know now. But isn't it odd though? Because anytime I know Sirhan, Sirhan, you know, oh, yeah. you know, John Wilkes Booth, you know. Yeah, I think there's there's been a push in the last twenty years with social media and all that it, to try to keep their names out of the press. And I think that's a good idea. I think you don't want to make these guys famous. I mean, even the guy that shot Lennon, you know, Mark David Chapman. I know that guy's name, but right. I don't know this guy's name. I think when the school shootings really ramped up in the '90s into the 2000s, there was uh, a, people started going we don't need to make these kids famous yeah and have a you know because yeah that makes sense had a fame culture it's our it's, right, second biggest story i think joe biden dropping out and not unexpectedly because he had a lot of pressure on him but he was so he kept saying such confident things that he's running he's running yeah. and i guess he had to but did for you him watch the debate of him yeah i didn't no i mean i watched the highlights and i could barely get watch it I oh mean, it was terrible yeah. To me, it's pretty obvious he was struggling for the past year on and off. Mm-hmm. Sometimes he would do better than other times. Mm-hmm. But it's like with both with Trump and Biden, it's like we're setting a pretty low bar for a president. Like, well, he, he put some sentences together. He did <laughs> all right. You know, Trump didn't cuss at all during the whole speech. You know, it's like we have such a low bar for these guys. 
where you know we should have more uh, presidential we, presidential we let's expect something of our presidents why are we always you know what if you're on Trump's forming side, complete sentences is really a low bar you're right yeah and, if you're a democrat you you do it for biden you try to make excuses if you're on trump's side you do it for him every time he and i just think that's a bad place to be is try because we're so tribal we just try to make excuses for whoever's on our side we need to expect more from our presidents i mean or from any elected official i saw some buddy from Trump's campaign and they were because they were trying to react to Biden passing the torch and now mm-hmm. reacting to what Harris is uh, is going to campaign and do and and he admitted that they were sort of taken aback in the reporter I don't remember what, what channel asked them well why are you why are you so stunned why is this such a weird moment and they said we didn't really think Joe would drop out we really didn't think he would and the, and so I don't know if it was his plan all along just that rhetoric get past a certain point in the in the campaign cycle and then drop this bomb had he planned this for a while was it a sudden decision I would love to know the strategy if there was indeed a strategy beyond him just being pressured out by Nancy Pelosi or whomever right. you know yeah like it's time to go Joe but I'm sure there'll be books written eventually probably but I'd, I'd like to hear that behind the scenes thing was it always his strategy and if so that worked pretty well because the focus was on him the whole time. The the, the Trump's team f- didn't really work on any kind of anti-Harris. You know, there's no there's no campaigning around her. Yeah, they were not she prepared wasn't the to make the shift for sure. Right, and so now they have to, and I think that they're they're still in scrambling mode because they're trying to find something that will stick. You can see them throwing all kinds of words at her, all kinds of names. And nothing really seems to be attaching itself with any kind of permanence outside the base that they already have because they're going right. to automatically shift to her. And, but I'm talking about like swing voters and undecideds. I just don't think that they're – and the polls are kind of showing this too, even though I don't necessarily trust them after 2016. That It doesn't seem to be having much of an impact on her. Like nothing they're doing is bringing her down. Her numbers seem to keep steadily climbing. Yeah. So we'll see where that goes. You know, I, we've, we've never – people try to make parallels in history. Obviously, we, we go back and look at – People are comparing him to Johnson, who dropped out in 68. Truman, of course, didn't run. Johnson didn't drop out because term. he was too old. He dropped out because of Vietnam, though, right? Right. And he he was there for the primaries and did horrible and realized, okay, mm. uh, I can't win. I'll drop yeah. out. Do so, you think this is one of the most historic decisions that a president's ever made? Then? Yeah, volun- I say voluntarily, loosely, once again. Who mm-hmm. knows how much pressure in the background? But seemingly, he chose to drop out for the good of the country. But you don't see people do that. You don't see incumbent presidents that mm-hmm. give up power voluntarily. Be- I mean, he could have hung on. You know, he's old, so he has good days and bad days. Right. And I don't know the protection around him and not letting how bad he was out or whatever. And I, I don't know how much of the decision was his. But it, from the outside, if nothing changes, really, that's still a, a pretty important thing that he decided. Now, he might know, know something that's coming that we don't know. Yeah, maybe. Uh, and he wants to just get out of the way. But, but I say, okay, correct me if I'm wrong. But as president, nobody can really tell you what to do, right? I mean, he didn't. I mean, ha- yeah, really, he yeah. didn't have to. He, ultimately, he had to make that decision. Don't you? Isn't that correct? Yeah. And he kept saying, "I beat Trump once. I'll beat him again." You mm-hmm. know, it's just kind of. And he had a whole machinery of this campaign going. And here's another shocking thing: how quickly she's not only take over being the candidate, but organized this machine behind her. I mean, I still thought she'd be struggling to try to get Democrats to support her even now. And it happened quickly. No, it was very I quick. think I think Democrats were ready to, yeah. to support somebody that was, you know... There was, if you watch anything to go along with the Democratic Party, there was an instantaneous shift from doom and gloom and, oh boy, I mean, it's going to be a struggle and he's going to struggle and we're going to have to make excuses. And it just, it is not because of his service, not because of his intelligence, though, because of his age. You're right. And yeah. they knew it and everybody knew it around him, too. But then now, all of a sudden, you like you put a plug in that, you spin that dial over to her, and all of a sudden, it's like a brand new day for them. Yeah, even kind of like the left-leaning radicals in the party. They've pulled more are, to the to the middle. Are, yeah, and so is she, so is she. Of course, she's well, she was kind of leaning left, and now she's having to pull back. Don't you think normal. that? Don't you think that that sort of those and a lot of those folks have been primaried out too? By the way, did you see that? Right. Yeah. Several people have not come back from the whatever the, the squad or whatever they right, call it. Yeah. And maybe that's that's a signal to the other ones to kind of tone down too. Not that they don't have a progressive agenda, but at the same time, there's a different. You don't have to be so. You don't have to be so that. To try right. to get some things done, move to the middle and work with somebody instead of just this, you know, vitriol that we've been hearing all this time. Well, you know, our whole country was founded on compromise. The con- the Constitution was was a lot of groups coming together and making something happen. We have to have that situation, and that only happens in the middle. You know, you can go far left, far right for a while. You can pull the party that way for a little bit, 
But if we're going to keep going as a country, it has to reshift back to the center at least some. So Regardless of who going. wins the election, do you think that that push back to the middle will keep going? I hope so. Look, I mean, you know, things have to change. Things will get pushed one way or another. But Maybe we it's need not to... good for media ratings if things are in the middle and people are compromising. I wonder how much of that is a factor. Uh, well, I think a big factor right now is we're in a political flux. We don't really know what the Republicans are. Are they the neocons of yesteryear, or are they are they Trump's party now? And I think they're leaning more towards Trump's party, which is a very different party than the if Reagan party. If he loses party. this election, I've heard pundits speculate that maybe his grasp on the party will be slipping. Maybe. There's going to be people that are going to try to make hay out of it. There's going to be some, you know, mini Trumps try to, to harness what he created and it could even be his own kids. Well, you think about compromise. To try to keep it going. Well, true. But think about compromise, though. Harris, last night on the interview that she had on CNN with her and Walls, said that she would definitely consider putting a Republican in her cabinet. Yeah. Like, who's ever said that on right. either side? I know. I mean, we need more of that. We cannot. I think so, too. I mean, I, I, think it's, it's a, I think it's a bold statement. We'll see if it plays out. But her rationale, which is something that I thought was a good answer, was... I need to have people around me who have a different opinion of me so that I can do a better job of sorting through the information and making a decision. Like, that's a solid answer. Regardless of which party you're in, that's a solid answer. Yeah. And it, I would love it if politicians could rise above the media slant and all of the, You know, we used to rely on the media to be the watchdogs mm -hmm. after Nixon and all that to try to keep things straight. Mm -hmm. Now they're the ones encouraging this polarization. Mm -hmm. So we need people to rise above that and actually get back to what, the values that Americans hold dear, working men and women, you know, what really affects people's lives and ignore the media now. It's which, which is crazy to think because that's how we get our information. And it also shows we don't, maybe we don't need a year long election in campaigns and a billion Other dollars spent. Other countries don't, yeah. Because Harris has taken over with a couple months and ready to go. Let's, let's just do it. Now she's a known name. She was vice president. She gets the advantage of having that whole campaign structure already going. But I still think that would be good for our country is if we could shorten the campaign season. All right. So there's three big things. I mean, she's the first woman of color to run as a major candidate from one major political well, not party. not run, but to be nominated. To be nominated. Yeah. She's run, she, she ran before. And we have Joe Biden, who is, is he the only incumbent president that dropped out? You know, obviously he didn't have to deal with the primaries, but drop out this close to an election. I, I was going to ask you that question. I think so. so. Yeah. I mean, I'm just kind of glancing back at some of the presidents that decided not to run. I mean, Calvin Coolidge, he didn't do it for the country. He just hate, he hated being president. He wanted <laughs> to get out of the way. Quiet uh, cow. Um, Teddy Roosevelt, of course, promised the American people. Well, let's go back so, to that since you said that. That reminds me. Biden did say during that campaign season that he would not run for a second term. He said that. And, yeah. and I know that people... This is what gets me, and this is some of the questions and answers from last night that I hear, and then I hear flack after that online. Well, so-and-so changed their position. Well, so-and-so changed their mind. Well, they're not consistent on this. Well, they flip-flop. Those are interesting words to use. I would love to have a leader who would look at information and go, ooh, based on the strength of this evidence and the strength of the argument, you know, the, oh, I have now changed my mind based on this. Like It's okay to do that. That's what intelligent people do. You look at evidences, you hear arguments, and then you make a strong decision based on that, as opposed to saying, nope, it's this all the time, I'll never change. Like, that's ridiculous. Oh, it's stupid. But that's, but that's Imagine part when you of, were I think 20 that's part of the game, I and guess. what you thought about life. And oh, I was never a moron when I was Me 20. Too. I mean, we teach our kids to be open-minded, curious, find evidence, and then you can change your mind. Why would we expect our politicians to hold on to something they don't even believe? Right. Of course, that's the game, right? It's tribal. You have to check all the boxes well, on this side. You don't want to piss off certain donors, I guess, but still. But don't criticize people for changing their mind if, it, if they can have a good explanation why. And, and I know politicians will dance around a question like that. Well, And she tap danced around a couple of things last night, but, but then it did answer some others as well. You know, if somebody asks somebody a question like, well, I don't want to answer that. Well, you, you said this, but then you did this. Why is that? Explain that. Yeah. And don't, don't be this whole, you flip-flopped. That's a stupid term, number one. Mm -hmm. Why did you change your mind is a better question. And what do you think the outcome, the better outcome will be now that you've changed your mind? And then let them explain that. That would be great. I would love that kind of reporting. And, uh, and sometimes answer. that's true, although sometimes they flip-flop, as you say, or change their minds based on political Well, expediency. sometimes that is true. Yeah, so right. like they're but, changing their minds because it gives them more votes. But what I'm saying is if you, if you ask the question that way, they would give you a chance to for them to explain that then... You could say, okay, well, that was a stupid reason to change. Right. 
or it was a politically motivated or a financially motivated one or yeah. lobbyist motivated one, whatever. But, th- but then you would know as opposed to just like, you flip-flopped. Like that doesn't, that doesn't give me the information I need. Although the politician is probably going to skip that question and try to curve around it yeah, without yeah. it. Well, explain it. Well, I just, I don't know. <laughs> let, me, let me answer this by saying something completely different. Right. Yeah. Yeah, it's hard to tell if a politician changes because they have presented new evidence and they really believe it, or if they're doing it for yeah. political reasons. Right, um, but it's still to give somebody a chance to explain that'd be handy. What's your other? What's, what else you got on the list there? Um, well, you know what's crazy about this time period and the time period we took off is we still have two wars rolling yep. that we have kind of put in a drawer again. I mean, this is what America does: we freak out about something for a while. And then we put it in a drawer. It's still happening, but we're not really so as concerned. And we knew it would get overshadowed. So the Hamas-Israel conflict that's mm-hmm. that's still rolling and spreading, and who knows what's going to come out of that. And Russia-Ukraine that's been going on so long, I can't remember life before it. <laughs> um, well, right, yeah. It's like continues on. I mean, what does that say about us as a nation and how our attention span? I mean, we love politics. Politics has now become sports. It's overshadowing these international events that in the long run, these wars will probably be way more influential, but we just love the here and now and the politics of the time. Well, you know, it's football season. That's true. That's all. That's another thing. So people get distracted. Trump's 34 felony in, indictments was this, you know, this yeah, year. Not like just in May. but... Yeah. Oh, yeah. Guilty. Yeah. And it's like, okay, Next, yeah, his convictions. <laughs> you, know? Well, you know, I've seen people. This is just bizarre. People who are very pro military, very pro uh, police, uh, get all kinds of twisty. If you were to say anything about uh, reform or or anything like that, but then uh, I saw this picture. I support the police, and yet they'll have another shirt that says, "I'm voting for the felon." Like I've seen those shirts. I'm They're voting the law for the law and order. Well, how are you? How are you squaring those things? I don't know. Like that's a, there's some mental gymnastics going on there. I think. Yeah, well, it's a low bar once again. Well, well those I guess those people go. That's it's rigged, just like the, the, he's falsely guilty. Right, he's yeah. not really guilty. I guess you have to do that. You have to rationalize it away. That way, you can. Yeah, we we trust our law and order until our law and order rules in a way we don't like, <laughs> <laughs> and then it's rigged. I mean, what do you think about the these? Speaking of changing your mind with new evidence, maybe you've got RFK. That's now come out for Trump. You got Tulsi Gabbard. Uh-huh. You got Elon Musk donating how many ever many millions to the Trump campaign. Mm-hmm. And, you know, these three historically have been Democrat, liberal, or at least more. On, and Elon Musk, of course, kind of started switching later. But if you look at the history, they these are liberal people, Democratic people that are now all in for Trump. Mm-hmm. What is it? Political expediency? Or is there really something there that they see where Trump is the less of Lesser of two evils. That's that's so hard to know. Uh, is, but yeah. yeah, so well, even Trump himself was Democrat at one time. Right. For of most course, of his yeah. adult life, he voted that way. I, I, I mean, I assume he voted. I say that he did. So yeah, but why do these other people support? You got to believe in something, I guess, or you believe that there's some benefit to you politically or financially to tie yourself onto this wagon and and hope that it's going in the direction you want. I mean, I don't know. That's It's got to be, especially for rich people and for certain politicians, I guess. I wouldn't say mm-hmm. local politicians necessarily, but on the national level. Like, you, you make those strategic decisions of loyalty based on, you know, survivability for you and your career, I suppose. You and, and the constituents and your lobbyists and whoever, you know, whoever's got maybe control over, I mean, if, I, if you're a certain person and you need financial backing, and you can't get it anywhere else. Maybe you just go here because there is that money available. I don't know. There's all kinds of things that might right. cause yeah, somebody to do that behind the scenes. I don't know this just about how they actually feel. I don't. I, there's a there's a huge uh, an unmasking that you would have to get through to get to the real reason of who they are and what they support. Do yeah. you have to believe in Trump to support Trump's campaign? Probably not. I mean, I think Elon Musk is different than the other two. I think for RFK and for Gabbard, I think it was literally, literally they got to pick a side because that's what you have to do in this country. Mm-hmm. You can't be independent. That you, If you stay independent, that is, you're dead in the water. Bernie Sanders found that out years ago. You mm-hmm. got to bow down to one side or the other. And I think they're, they're trying to look at politically, what can I do to keep my name going, to keep my brand going, mm-hmm. to keep the money flowing? Hey, that's pretty good. Or maybe if <laughs> maybe if one group has shunned you or rejected you in some way, then you automatically are just going to jump on. Wasn't the that other the side. report RFK reached out to? Yeah, yeah, he reached out to the Harris campaign, and uh, apparently, I don't know if he spoke to Kamala specifically or if it was just the campaign, campaign people. 
And they were like, we're not interested. And isn't it illegal to promise somebody a, a cabinet post? Quid pro, pro quo? Isn't that the... I don't think... <laughs> I'd have to... I wish Nixon was here to answer that question. Is it illegal? Because Trump apparently did yeah. promise him a cabinet position, uh-huh. a RFK a, a cabinet position, if if Trump gets elected. And like, I don't know ha- if that's... How he says all these horrible things about him. <laughs> right. And then immediately, yeah, I'll give you, you... It's all good. I mean, if you just... You could go back two months. He's the worst candidate in history. Mm-hmm. His father would be so ashamed well, of even, him. Even, and now I'll give uh, you a cabinet position. <laughs> even Trump's running mate, Vance... You go back and look just a little while ago, and he's like, he's the American Hitler, and how dare nobody could support, and he's the most vile, blah, blah, blah. And now he's like, well, I uh, I would love to hear somebody ask him, why did you change your mind? Yeah. You know what this is? This is professional wrestling. I guess it, so. It, it, it's professional wrestling in the 80s when people thought it was real. Hulk Hogan, the whole thing. Like, mm-hmm. you look at it, we, we're talking about it like it's reality. Like, these people really care about the American people, that they're trying to make good decisions, probably in... It's just a charade. It's a game for all of them. And, but what's sad is, unlike professional wrestling, it has real effects. <laughs> like Now, I do think state and local politics are more, uh, you know, they, these are the things that actually affect people's lives. A lot of the national politics is just a show. But some of it does trickle down, of course, especially the culture war that we're in. Mm-hmm. But, you know, we're talking about it as if these people should rise above the game when they're in the game. Right. You know, why don't Hulk Hogan actually fight this guy? <laughs> you know, why don't he go in there and start really swinging and punching and see what happens? Well, no, it's it's, a, it's all fake. It's all predetermined in a way. Um, I'm not saying all of it is, of course. Choreographed, maybe? I'm sure there's to a, a lot. Extent. Yeah, they know some stuff that we don't know. I mean, there's a lot of back rooms, I think, still, and people I mean, whispering in each other's ear. Each group knows its audience, too, I suppose, and oh, you have to yeah. play to your audience. And media, too. They're in on it now. So, right. you know, once again, they used to be the outsiders looking in to keep everything straight. Now they're part of the game. They mm-hmm. have to appeal to their audience to get money, to get clicks, to get likes. And now politicians have to do that. They have to get clicks and likes, and they have to say the little sound bites. And we're getting to this point where what happens when politics doesn't matter, when people just check out completely and they, you know, either stop voting. You know, Ben Franklin apparently once said, you know, when they when asked after the Constitutional Convention, did you give us a monarchy or a republic? And he looked at this woman and said, a republic, if you can keep it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> And it is up to us to keep it and to keep politics real and in check and have these people. You know, some of them seem genuine. Some of them seem more fake than others. But it's... I know a lot of people who get frustrated with the process and how long it may take to institute change or get people out that they disagree with. If you are if you are in a state where you're a minority voter, and I don't mean that from an ethnic standpoint, but you, mm-hmm. right, you... If your party isn't the dominant party and their politics is not to your liking, I mean, you, you can't just move necessarily. You have to kind of deal with that. But then I think there would be this uh, frustration in saying, well, why, why should I even bother? Because I'm not going to make a difference because it's I'm, my vote's going to be swamped over, you know. And then yeah. uh, so, I mean, I, I know that there are people who've said things like that, but it, I, I think it still matters no matter what. Like because you've got your voice out there and you can and vote your conscience or whatever. Oh, yeah, say, I think you know? so. That's the only way we keep this thing rolling. All right. Well, it's about closing time. So uh, thank you all for joining us on our first episode of season 10. Goodbye.